from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. We're so glad you could join us this evening and we hope that you will do so again. We have a great venue going here with events all the time. We do this Life of a Poet series uh, four times a year in conjunction with the Library of Congress, but we do a lot of other great stuff. Coming up this weekend of special interest, we have our annual Emancipation Day Forum uh, named after the hospital's first patient, an African-American sailor named Benjamin Drummond. So we'll have lectures going on starting tomorrow night and throughout the rest of the weekend about African-American history and struggles. So it's going to be a lot of good sort of in-depth educational stuff this weekend if you're free to join us here. Uh, but now I will turn it over to Rob Casper to introduce our guests. Thank you, Eli. Ooh, hey, there's a new sound system. Doesn't it sound great? Um, I'm so excited. I'm also turning off my phone, and you should too. Um, let me move out of the way. Um, Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming out. We're so excited to see you here at the Hill Center. Well, we've been doing this uh, quite, a, quite a, a few times. This is, this is yeah, our 17th? 17th. Very exciting. Um, thanks to Eli, who's manning the, the sound in the back, uh, and to Charlotte and to the rest of the uh, Hill Center staff for continuing to has, have us here hosting this terrific series. Of course, I want to thank the Washington Post, too, and Ron Charles. Um, I, every 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 event, I try to say something new and wonderful about Ron, but I decided I was just going to say I really cannot say enough good things about Ron. <laughs> you can try. <laughs> so yeah, that's what you're in for tonight. Um, the Poetry and Literature Center at the Library of Congress. We are home to the U.S. Poet Laureate. Our current Poet Laureate is Tracy K. Smith. She just got renewed for a second term. Worth checking her out. Uh, if you want to know more about the events that we do, most of which take place at the library down the street, but a few which take place here and around the country, you can go check out our website, www.loc.gov slash poetry. Um, now, I get to introduce one of my dearest and oldest friends, Matthew Zapruder. Matthew was born here, and in fact, he went to school just around the corner from my apartment. And Don, uh, he, he went to the same high school that you teach at. So he wants to talk about some teachers you may have heard of back in those days. Um, our paths first crossed, though, far later when we were both graduate students at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Matthew was literally the first student I met at the program. The appointed greeter for incoming MFA students, he shook hands with anyone who, still slightly lost as I was, wandered into the grad student lounge. I could argue that in the years that followed, Matthew would find new and ever more powerful ways to welcome writers and readers to the art. There is his work as an editor of Verse Press Wave Books and as last year's editor of the poetry column for the New York Times Magazine, as well as his work as co-director of the Bagley Wright lecture series, which we've hosted at the library. All this work has done much to get poems and poetry criticism out into the world. Matthew has also written his own collection of poetry criticism, Why Poetry, published last year by Echo Press. It has received all sorts of praise, but let me just say I've never seen someone who's given more of his time and effort or has spent as much of that time and effort worrying over every detail in arguing for the value of poems in our lives. And I am impressed by how Matthew weaved his own story of coming to poems as part of the book's argument. Finally, and most importantly for tonight, Matthew is the author of four terrific poetry collections, Sun Bear, Come On All You Ghosts, The Pajamaists, and American Linden. He also collaborated with pa painter Chris Uphughes, is that how I say it? Chris Uphughes, uh, on For You in Full Bloom, and co-translated Romanian poet Eugen Jeblinau's last collection, Secret Weapon, Selected Late Poems. Matthew's honors include the William Carlos Williams Award from the Poetry Society of America, the May Sarton Prize from the Academy of American Arts and Letters, the Tupelo Press Editor's Prize, and fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation and the Lennon Foundation. 
He currently lives all the way across the country in Oakland, California, and is an associate professor at St. Mary's College. I have so many stories I could tell about Matthew, but for now, let me say something about his last book of poems, Sun Bear. I read the whole book in one fell swoop on a subway train back home to Brooklyn after a long week in DC. I'd been traveling for hours and was pretty sapped, yet I'll never forget how I floated page by page and stop by stop as if in a vehicle of another kind. It was the perfect way to experience his book, among a car full of traveling strangers, each easy to ignore. But Matthew's poems made me think of how connected we all can be, how much we desire a way to speak and see and know each other. It's this great empathic charge that I think ma makes Matthew's poems so necessary, and I can't imagine a better person for him to engage with on poems and connection and, frankly, on how to live than our dear Ron Charles. Please join, please join me in welcoming them both. Well, thank you very much. Uh, can you all hear me? We didn't get a chance to test our mics. Are they on? No. Matthew? No. Your mic on? I don't know. Is it? I think mine's on. I'm not on. That's because I project. <laughs> let's see. Let's see. No, no, let's see. Where's your. No, we'll see. Mine's off. It's on. It's on. It's on. Is it on standby? It's on mute. Is it on mute? There you go. There you go. Okay, how's that? Now you can hear me. Okay, now I will not project. Thank you so much for doing this with us. Thank you for having me. It's wonderful to meet yeah. you in person. Uh, I read your book of criticism, My Poetry, last year when Elizabeth Lund reviewed it for The Post. She loved it. Uh, and then I had the pleasure of reading all your poems. Uh, and they're brilliant and uh, humane and very provocative. Uh, but you said as, as a young person you could never have imagined yourself being a professional poet. Why was that? Oh, I just don't think I knew any poets or just even, it just wasn't even my realm of possible. I mean, I, I think I was more interested in being a wide receiver for the Washington Redskins than, <laughs> a, than a poet. Um, so yeah, I just didn't think of that in any kind of way as being, I wasn't, I didn't think of writers as being really living beings. I just, there were people who had written books and they were either dead or functionally dead because they were <laughs> away from me. And, um, and then when I got into music, that was different because I, 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 I really, really got into music and playing music and then got into the music scene here in DC. And then I met all kinds of people who made music and played in bands. Were you writing so, lyrics? I didn't really write lyrics. I'm not a very good songwriter. Okay. I, play, I play guitar. And so musicians were real people to me. But who, who were living and making the art now. But poets, I don't, I just don't think I, it just entered into my head that there was like a thing that people did. In one poem you write, I grew up a wonderful, sullen boy, close enough to the Capitol building to dream of hitting it with a stick, but did not. Yeah, that sums it up. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if you'd read a poem, poem sure. by us by, uh, called uh, Tonight You'll Be Able. Yeah. Tonight you'll be able. Can everybody hear me okay? Or, yeah. Tonight you'll be able. It may feel good to go wherever. Desires lead you into old, familiar, destructive awareness. Going a thousand miles away seems to be keeping up. Unsettled and anxious signals, they're so microscope. Be a sleuth. Tiny sparkling under those around you sees you feeling and waiting. Life today is slow-moving coworkers. Respond by giving your profile a new sense of clarity and feel ready to share your outlook, even if they may not be as excited. It makes you good to spread your joy. People, it's harder to be yourself. A series of role-playing opportunities appeases, showing the authentic you won't hurt anything. Focus on your lovely find that there are many more things. Tonight, you'll be able to talk to anyone about anything. Make all the loved ones muster up. Chat with character, keep alive the conversations. You feel you're getting something someone gives you. The key to a series of coincidences you play matchmaker to. An odd couple, the present you and the future in a big suit, a new haircut, 
or better than anticipated funds. A few minor changes to June. Love partners, your lucky numbers are 4, 7, 18, 21, and 32. Ask yourself, what would I do if I knew I could not fail? It's a lovely, hopeful poem. Thanks. Do you want to know a secret about that poem, Ron? Yes, I do. I won't All tell anyone. All the language is from the horoscope. Um, it's 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 two from two horoscopes in the Chicago Tribune. I was traveling, um, and I and I was sitting with my friend Joshua Beckman, and we were in a kielbasa Polish kielbasa place, and we decided we were going to write a poem. And I had this newspaper, I had the Chicago tri Tribune, or sometimes one of the two Chicago papers in front of me, and they had two horoscopes, which struck me as very funny that you would have two horoscopes. It seems like that creates immediate chaos. <laughs> like, why not one, you know, it's hard enough as it is to know what to do. So, so I just started cutting out all the language of those things um, and, and rearranging it and made the poem out of those. So it's all, all, that's all language from horoscopes. A found poem. Yeah, but that, not really a found, I mean, I, I moved them around a lot. And, right. But yeah, but it's all, that is, I think that's probably the only poem I've ever written like that that's all found language, oh. like that. That's amazing. Uh, well, now you're a poet, but you're also a critic and an editor. Uh, how did that transition come to be from music? Well, um, I tell the story about this in the Why Poetry book, but what happened is, is that I played music um, for a long time and was in different bands and sort of uh, always secretly wanted to be a writer, yes. but I hadn't really ever written anything. <laughs> and. Uh, I figured out, I went to graduate school for Slavic languages and literatures. I had been a Russian major in college and then I went to UC Berkeley to get a PhD and I knew pretty much right away that was not going to be my career path. Um, wasn't going to be a big success in, as a scholar, but uh, I thought, well, if I want to be a writer, I should start writing. Yes. I better write. Poems. And I didn't know. I just knew I needed to write. So I just sat down at a desk and basically started writing. Every day, you know, I try to write, and I wrote poems. It was it was very strange. I was studying Russian poetry at the time, and and getting, but it was it was very odd. I didn't I didn't you know I didn't think that was necessarily what was going to happen. And I started writing poems, and then once that started to happen, then I tried to figure out what was going on, you yes. know, what was happening with poetry and what it all meant and everything to you've educate a, myself. You've got a poem called "This Handwriting." Mm -hmm. If you read that, yeah. It seems to have a lot to do this with This is very exciting, by the way, because I have no idea what he's going to ask me to read, so it's <laughs> really like... Uh, well, they're all no. yours. So yeah, that's some, true. So I have, the, I, yeah, I have some idea, but um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, th this handwriting. This afternoon, I heard the small voice speaking again, though no one was there. I could not hear the words, though from the helpless, complicated tone, I knew it was something like, Someday you will realize you already know you must go elsewhere to be free. Maybe the white island with just a few necessary buildings you saw once from above as if you were flying. All your friends in gentle, laughing disputation are already waiting. For now, I settle for trying to picture each of their faces. But when I close my eyes, I just keep seeing this horrible, actual sunny floor I've scattered pages of my handwriting on searching for a pattern, and also this table. Upon it lies a yellow book containing a translation of the half-burned gospel that says often Jesus kissed Mary on the mouth. Reading it makes me feel as if the true future, like the son of a dethroned king, long ago hid in a cave, trying to silence his breathing. The great black indeterminate stallion pounded implacably by. Now there's only silence, like an auditorium after a modern composition has just finished perfectly destroying our foolish, cherished ideas of music. When I think very hard about my thoughts, they seem to me to be very small horses attached to invisible reins, attached to facts. And what of my memories, like sleeping in daylight? A decade ago, I lived in Massachusetts, a shallow, terrible installation, leaking smoky versions of myself, each in turn emitting weak, soluble ideas, like people care only because they do not even know they feel they must. And now I'm here in California, happy to be, though always part of me is thinking of my friends and their shadows, 
patiently waiting for my shadow to join them. It seems like a poem about your writing, mm -hmm. about searching for an identity. Mm -hmm. Pretty critical, self-critical. Yeah. Uh, the small horses of your ideas. Yeah. Uh, searching for patterns. Your weak, soluble ideas. Yeah. Is that... Yeah, well, I, I think, you know, I, one thing about writing that's a terrible truth that I'm sure you must, I suspect you also know, a lot of people in this room know, is that, you know, often you're not very interesting to yourself or you have to go through a lot of kind of self-doubt and self-criticism and just feeling kind of not like you're particularly on your mark before something starts to happen. That's just part of that. I mean, maybe there are writers out there in the world who don't have to go through that. I've never met any. Mm -hmm. so, so that bringing that experience into the poem seemed more honest to me, mm -hmm. and also a good opportunity to like, make some jokes. Yes. You know, but, uh, but, um, At your own expense. You know, and, feel lo and I think the other thing about mm -hmm. writing is it, feels very, it can feel very lonely. And yeah. so I was feeling lonely in that poem, and then I was imagining my friends, but they keep kind of going away from me. You know, like they're not really there, actually. All right. that's there is my crummy poem that I'm working on. Right. Yeah. You know, but I have to just work through that. That's, that's the thing you, I think that's the thing you learn about writing, is you just gotta grind it out. A lot of it's grinding it out. I mean, that's been said many different ways before, but it's true. It taxes your confidence so dramatically, and yet it takes so much confidence to publish, mm -hmm. to put these things out into the world, and then have them be critiqued, sometimes cruelly, tritely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, once they're, once they're done and they're gone, I mean, it stings to get criticized. But the first part, the feeling of going through that self-doubt and self-criticism, that's a million times worse to me. That's so, my experience. I mean, I don't, you know, bad review. I mean, you can shake it off, right. you know, but... Because you've already done so much worse in your mind to yourself. Right. Uh, in well, a poem yeah. called Schwinn, you write, I will never know a single thing anyone feels, just how they say it, which is why I'm standing here exactly covered in shame and lightning, doing what I'm supposed to do. Yeah. <laughs> that's like a dramatic end of poem. That's kind of like the poem starts out with my bike getting stolen um, and then sort of wanders around and laments like the Redskins losing the Super Bowl and then to the Dolphins. Um, and then, uh, but, but the, uh, the end of the poem, I mean, that, was, that poem surprised me because the end of it is this almost statement of, you know, it's a statement of my purpose as an artist. Yes. And it shocked me when I wrote it. You know, I didn't think that's where the poem was going. I wasn't... I didn't say, like, oh, I must write a poem in which I assert my, my right as a poet to do whatever. But, but I, think I, just, I think that's just true. I don't actually know how people feel. I only know what they say, like on some kind of literal level. I mean, you know, for the most part, except if it's your intimate partner or something, you have physical contact with them. But I mean, otherwise, I don't know anything about you except what you tell me. And that distance is both tragic and exciting. And so that, the recognition of that fact led me to this belief that, huh, that's why I do this. Because I think that, that distance and that possibility of transmission is so exciting to me as a poet. And um, for us as readers, to read a well, poem hopefully. that speaks to you and to realize, oh my gosh, this person feels the same strange, inexpressible thing that I feel. Ho hopeful, yeah, that's the hope. That's the idea. I mean, you don't know. You don't right. know, when, and when to, but you throw it out. You, you, you know, at some point you have to stand... You know, at some point you have to be really honest with yourself as a poet. You know, you can't bullshit. Um, and then you're just yourself and your naked, ludicrous humanity and like, and, and saying the things that you, you seem true to you. And then if another person makes contact with that, it's like this, ama it's this amazing experience. It is for readers too. Yeah, well, I, I hope so. I mean, I felt that so many times on the other end of poems. Right. Right. For sure. So uh, You've written this book recently, your latest book called Why Poetry, which I highly recommend, by the way. It's uh, very smart, but uh, <clears throat> very humble, very well informed. It includes lots of poems, and he uh, talks about how to read poetry in a way that anybody who's beginning or experienced would profit from. Uh, I'm sure that it's for sale out in the lobby. I really recommend that, in addition to the, to the poems themselves. Uh, one of the poems in your collection begins, people say they don't understand poetry. <laughs> uh, and it seems to me this, collection, this essay collection you published uh, is in response to that oft-repeated statement, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, people carry so many incorrect ideas about poetry into their reading of it, ones that ruin the experience before they even get to have it. <laughs> 
What are those? What are those incorrect ideas we have about poetry? Just off the top of your head, from your experience teaching, that the words in the poems don't mean what they seem to mean. Yes. That's a problem. Yes. Um, that the language is inherent is coded. Yes. Like and and um, which is problematic because some of the words clearly do mean what they usually mean, but then if some don't, which ones are which? And what do they mean? And who knows the answer? That that's bad. That that's not helpful. Um, that seems like a pervasive idea that people have about poems, I've noticed. It's totally wrong. Um, also that, uh, yeah, the poems are always sort of about some big idea at the end, and there's some payoff of like deep wisdom that the poet has. That's also usually not the case. Um, they're they're uh, an experience or something that happens to you. And I think if people know who read, if you think about the poems you really love, or maybe an exp even an experience you had with a poem you loved, it's more like a process. It's an experience of being changed by it. It's not just valuable because of what comes at the end, you know. So I think those are two, like right off the top of my head. That That's good. Let's think about that last one. What you just said, that the poem <clears throat> is not something you ring until something valuable comes out of it, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, that does that does sound unpleasant, doesn't it? <laughs> it's like, yeah, torture the poem until it confesses. Right. Doesn't I think somebody has a poem with Billy Collins has a poem, yeah. 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 Uh, Good old Billy. You talked about the poem as being an experience with language. The... Yeah, or like a process. I mean, I compare it in the book to like a friendship or a conversation, um, especially maybe with a new friend. Sometimes a poem can feel that way. Mm -hmm. Like you meet someone interesting and you go out for coffee or beer or with them or whatever walk and. And you're not like, oh, I can't wait until he says the one thing that's really going to be. You're, you're sort of, you know, I don't think. I mean, maybe some of you do. Um, that reveals the so, secret. Sure. Yeah. You know, or like just, I hope, you know, I guess you could hope that the person says one interesting thing, I guess. But, but, but I mean, it's more like, oh, I'm enjoying being with this person. I'm feeling changed. I'm interested in what they're saying. They're, they're revealing themselves. And, and I'm not going to sit here and say that I understand everything about them and I'm completely done with this experience just after this one cup of coffee or beer or something. It's like the opposite should feel true, right? You should feel like, oh, that was great. Let's do that again. You know, and so I think poems should make you feel that way. They shouldn't be like, okay, now I know death is scary. Or, or like, you know, being alone is a bummer. You know, thanks for the information. I mean, that's the other thing about poems is like the, the information in them is just so banal. You know, like when even like my favorite, you know, you know, Ode to a Nightingale, death is scary. Like, thanks, Keats. I mean, that's not like, that's, that's one of my favorite poems. That's not why I like that poem, because the big reveal at the end, you know? Like, it's, it's not that. I mean, that's, and so that's why the teaching of poems is so annoying. If you look at the standardized tests, you know, they're, 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 where, they're, where they ask you for the theme of the poem, and it's, it's the list of possibilities is usually just such a stupid list. I mean, like, that's the big message, you know? I mean, like, nature is worth preserving or something. Right. And, you know, I don't think I need to read a poem to know that, you know? But, like, but the feeling that nature's worth preserving, okay, that's different. Like, that's a feeling that's, that's kind of cool. Like, if I read the poem and it makes me feel that way, okay, that's a whole different... Or if, it may, if I could feel like death is, you know, brought closer to that fear of death in some kind of interesting way, I mean, that's, that's, that's useful, you yes. know, for me. What goes wrong? Because all of us begin life... I think this is largely true, uh, reading and loving poems, right? As children, we're read, mm -hmm. people read to us, and they're mostly poems for yeah. a couple of years, and mm -hmm. we like them. And then it drifts away pretty fast. By yeah. high school and college, we're not reading collections of poems anymore. Most and most of us aren't. never go back. Why? Um, well, I, I wrote a lot about this in the book and then cut it out because it, I'm actually not a historian of education. I'm not, I'm not a, a, I don't really know the but answer. But you think you know. <laughs> well, I have some ideas about it, but I don't, I don't, I don't, and I read, I actually read a lot of the textbooks. I don't know how many of you all, um, uh, this, this, this book by Cleanth Brooks and Robert Penn Warren called Understanding Poetry. You're familiar with this book? It's, it's sold like a five million copies. It's the most popular poetry textbook. I'm sure there are people in this room who had it in high school. There's yeah. absolutely no way there isn't. But anyway, but I read this book and did a, wrote 15,000 words about the problems with it and then realized that this was the most boring thing <laughs> in the world to read. So I cut the whole thing out. In the book, I just say, these textbooks are problematic, trust me. And, like, and so, so, because I was, and, but yeah, no, I think, I think that, I think they replicate a lot of the problems that I'm talking about there. And, and plus, no one likes to be, I mean, who wants to be made to feel stupid? You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's that's another problem with the way poems are taught. It's like, yes. they don't, people don't get asked, 
you know, there's a way to talk about them that, that pushes people to read more deeply and carefully that's more respectful. Of their and then the, Yeah, or just like, what response. do we think about this? I mean, there's nothing more exciting in a classroom for me than dealing with this little square area of the text yes. and kind of digging into it and figuring out, okay, what's a poet actually saying and what's the next thing and why do you think they went from here to there or whatever. That's so exciting and it's so, it's this collective kind of exploration of, of the poem. It's such an amazing experience. But, but I've also seen poems taught in this way where it's like, well, what does it mean? And, and, and if you don't figure out the big secret and repeat it, then you're wrong and you're made to feel stupid or whatever. And that, that, that's not a good feeling. And I think that people don't like that. So they, and they transfer that resentment to poetry. You know? Yes, I agree. So totally. that's one thing that happens, but probably other things happen too. You, know? you said when you were young, you had the vague impression that poets used poetic language and techniques to express important thoughts or ideas in a more beautiful or complex or compressed way than prose. Yeah, I think I thought that's what poems were. I mean, if, it, if you had asked me, I would have said, yeah, it's just wisdom. It's wisdom in pretty language, I yeah. guess. You know. So what does poetry do better, and specifically, than other forms of literature? <laughs> uh, that's, that's what a lot of the book tries to, tries to uh, you know, account for. I think one thing it does is that it takes the material of language that we're also familiar with, and it doesn't, it doesn't submit to any need that we usually have for language. We usually have the need, we usually have the need for language to communicate information, like I'm doing right now, mm -hmm. or to give us information that we really need, or to convince us of something, yes. or to whatever. Poems are, I think they liberate themselves from those, all those obligations, mm -hmm. and explore what the material of language itself can do when it's freed from those, from those obligations. That's, 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 if I were gonna define a poem, that's what I would say. Um, so, but that doesn't mean that poems don't communicate information right. or, or, or convince or tell stories. They do, of course. I mean, you can see that in the poems that I read. They sometimes do. Right. But it just means they only do it as long as they feel like it, and then they do something else. There's this famous, uh, you, I'm sure you, this, this uh, principle of Chekhov's gun, you know, this idea that if in, a, in playwriting it's, or fiction writing, like if the gun is on the wall in the first act, then it has to go off by the end of the play. Well, poets don't care about that stuff. <laughs> the gun doesn't have to go off in a poem. Like, it's not that we don't live by those, we don't live by those rules. We only, we do what's beautiful. And if it's beautiful to mention the gun and never say anything about it again, that's what we're gonna do. And you, if you want your plot, you can go somewhere else. <laughs> you know? In one of your poems you write, I'm thinking about the hidden reasons I love something small. <laughs> seems like a great line about what a poem can do. To think deeply and cl clearly and cleverly about something <laughs> small we might not consider mm -hmm. otherwise. Mm -hmm. In another poem, you refer to your father playing the guitar and communicating many contradictory things, mm -hmm. which also seems like you're talking about what a poem can do. Yeah, and I mean, that poem, you know, it's like I'm thinking about my dad and, and that mystery of another person that you're close to, but like suddenly you see them as if from a great distance, mm -hmm. like all the things you don't know about them, especially a parent. Right. You know, this, you have those moments where you're like, God, I don't know my parents at all. Like, right. I have no idea who they are. You know, they're, they're these people who have this whole lives that, so that, that thing and, and I guess maybe the contradictory nature of that, of their feelings right. that might be. Why don't you read a poem called Pocket? Yeah, sure. These are all really good questions. <laughs> I want to ask you questions. <laughs> <laughs> it might happen. Um, pocket. Because I wonder if a poem is like a pocket. That's what I'm going to ask you when we're done. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that is maybe sort of the kind of point of the poem. Not the point of the poem, but the sort of like the secret. Meaning. That's a secret meaning. <laughs> you can pass on the test. You get an A. Um, okay. Pocket. I like the word pocket. It sounds a little safely dangerous, like knowing you once bought a headlamp in case the lights go out in a catastrophe. You will put it on your head and your hands will still be free. Or standing in a forest and staring at a picture in a plant book while eating scary looking wildflowers. <laughs> Saying pocket makes me feel potentially but not yet busy. I'm getting ready to have important thoughts. I'm thinking about my pocket, which has its own particular geology. Maybe you know what I mean. I mean, I basically know what's in there and can even list the items but also there are other bits and pieces made of stuff that might not even have a name. 
Only a scientist could figure it out. And why would a scientist do that? He or she should be curing brain diseases or making sure that asteroid doesn't hit us. Look out, scientists. Today, the unemployment rate is 9.4%. I have no idea what that means. I tried to think about it harder for a while, then tried standing in an actual stance of mystery and not knowing toward the world, which is my job as is staring at the backyard and for one second believing I am actually rising away from myself, which is maybe what I have in common right now with you. And now I'm placing my hand on this very dusty table and brushing away the dust. And now I'm looking away and thinking for the last time about my pocket. But this time I'm thinking about its darkness, like the bottom of the sea, but without the blind fluorescent creatures floating in a circle around the black box, which along with tremendous thunder and huge shards of metal from the airplane, sank down and settled here where it rests, cheerfully beeping. <laughs> and it's so, not, it's so amoral to end, like just. <laughs> Why? Just I don't know, just like, it just like, the imagining that huge plane crash, it just doesn't even mention all the people that died. And you know, it's like just interested in the beep of the black box. It's really, yeah, it's terrible. Apparently. Yeah, Richard Hugo is a poet who he has this um, great line where he says, the imagination is a cynic, which I think is a great, you know, I think there's a way that, you know, the artist or the, is like a magpie. What's a, is a magpie the bird that just picks things up? Yeah, like just like, oh, that's interesting and that's right. interesting and like doesn't really care. <laughs> you know, that much like about the bigger picture somehow that you have to, there's some way you have to be like that a little bit when you're, when you're making art. You just have to be interested in what's beautiful on some level. Like, um, and, and that just cracked me up when I, when I read that because it was like, oh God, it's so like, I mean, no actual planes were harmed in the making of this poem. <laughs> but like, but, but I mean, still, it's like a little bit, you know, like. <laughs> <laughs> That's such a humble image when you talk, you basically I know what's in there. You can even list the items, but there's also other bits and pieces made of stuff that might not even have a name. I mean, it, it strikes me as a, a metaphor of the poem itself, mm -hmm. that you know basically what's in the poem, but you don't know everything that's in the poem. <laughs> yeah. the, poem the poet does not entirely understand his own yeah. creation. Well, that's true. That's for sure true. I mean, I don't think... I think that's when it gets exciting, when it starts to get a little bit out of your control. Rob and I were talking about this downstairs a little bit, that when you, when you feel the poem start to escape, escape your control, you know, and then, and then if you've done it for a while, you can sort of let it go farther and farther and still maintain some kind of, you know, there's probably some analogy with different other human behaviors here, but like you, you know, like you can kind of let it go more and more and still keep it together. Right. And how far you can let it go and still keep it together is exciting. But you know there are parts of the poem that you're, whose implications you are not controlling. I think that that's the point of the poems for me. Mm -hmm. That's why I write them, because I want the poem to provide a space for those moments to exist mm -hmm. when I don't understand what's going on. You know, I need that. Not, not understand, I don't mean don't understand like in a semantic way. I mean, right. I understand what the words mean, yes. but why they feel significant to me. Right. Toward the end of your book, uh, Why Poetry, you talk about the danger of trying to use poetry for overtly political purposes. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, well, and. And. <laughs> Stalling. <laughs> we do, we have seen uh, since the election a lot of very overtly political poetry. Uh, some of it is obvious and bad. Uh, some of it is very emotionally powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the dividing line between when it works and when it's just kind of everybody preaching to the choir about how horrible such and such is? Rob and I have an ongoing conversation about this. I mean, first of all, I think when I said that it was, I think my point was is that political material is, is difficult to manage in a poem. Yes. Because it can, it can swamp other things. I mean, I think that was, that, was, that was sort of what my And it becomes obvious. Was. Right. I mean, obvious isn't so, for me, obviousness isn't such a problem. Okay. Like, I don't mind if things are obvious, actually, and mm -hmm. really direct. Uh, it's, um, it's more that that becomes ugly. Hmm. But not, and, I, and again, I mean, it's not that I want everything to be fancy language or beautiful, but it's somehow um, lifeless. Hmm. And, and so, you know, it has no movement. It has no, it, has, it, doesn't, it doesn't move. It isn't alive feeling. Right. 
And I think that when the poem just becomes just this inert thing on the page of mutual agreement. Yes. I think part of the, part of, okay, you wanna know what I really think the problem is? I think, I think the problem is, is, is that in a lot of these political poems that I've read that aren't good, they start from a place of certainty, yes. and they don't, nothing, which is, that in and of itself isn't a problem, that, that could be fine, but they don't change. They're just reiterations of the same idea over and over again until you get to the end, and they, and they are just, a, they're just, there's no, they're static, basically. Yeah. Like, that's, that's more the issue that I have with them. Like, yeah. that they, so it's not, it's not the certainty, it's not the subject matter, it's not the passion or commitment. In fact, those things can be really great in art. It's that, it's that they don't move. You know, they're lifeless. Yeah. Should read a poem called I think. Canada. Yeah, speaking of political poem, deeply yeah. political poem. <laughs> yeah. I wrote, I think this poem. It's one of my favorites. Oh. Thanks. Are you about yeah. to say how you don't? No, no, no. I was going to say that um, I think I wrote. Well, you this, got like, it off the back of cereal the, boxes. During the, yeah, no, no, no. This is all me. Um, it's uh, it's uh, written during the George uh, W's presidency, and I think there was a lot of talk at the time about you know we should all go to Canada. Or Canada is so great. <laughs> Canada is a healthcare system, you know. So I was feeling a little resentful of, of Canada. Um, Canada. By Canada, I have always been fascinated. All that snow and acquiescing, all that emptiness, all those butterflies marshaled into an army of peace. <laughs> Moving north away from me, Canada has no border. Away like the state, its northern border withers into the sky dome. In a world full of mistrust and self-medication, I've always hated Canada. It makes me feel like I'm shouting at a child for letting a handful of pine needles run through his fist. Canada gets along with everyone while I hang, a dark cloud above the schoolyard. I know we need war, all the skirmishes to keep our borders where we've placed them, all the migration, all the difference. Just like Canada, the Dalai Lama is now in Canada, and everyone is fascinated. When they come to visit me, no one ever leaves me saying, the most touching thing about him is he's so human. <laughs> or, or I was really glad to hear so many positive ideas regardless of the consequences expressed. <laughs> or I could drink a case of you. No one has ever peddled every inch of thousands of roads through me to raise awareness for my struggle for autonomy. I have pity but no respect for others, which is not compassion, just ordinary love based on attitudes towards myself. I wonder how long I can endure. In Canada, the leaves are falling. When they do, each one rustles, maybe, to the white-tailed deer of sadness. And it's clear that whole country does not exist to make me feel crappy, like a candelabra hanging above the prison world, condemned to freely glow. <laughs> The canon of anti-Canada poems Sentiment. is small. Yeah, but deeply, deeply, but deeply felt. felt. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it'd be a very small anthology of anti-Canada poems. <laughs> it's a very witty poem, uh, and it does what you were just talking about, the way it uh, challenges certainty, disrupts our certainty, disrupts pat political attitudes and ideas uh, in very complicated and Can I tell you one funny thing about that poem? Ways. Yes. I read that poem once in Canada. <laughs> and as I was leaving the room where I'd read it, I heard one person say to another, did he say white-tailed deer of sadness? It's <laughs> like, no, you heard wrong, completely wrong. I would never say anything like that. <laughs> well, let's stand up for just a few minutes, turn around, sit back down. <laughs> Chairs are a bit hard. I like it. I like a little yoga. <clears throat> okay, let's sit down. <laughs> it's not really an intermission. Did you get that from your from your wife? I did from my yeah, wife. Yeah, I bet yes. you did. That's that's like she a said, total teacher trick. The kids cannot sit this long. Right? Yeah, the kids cannot sit this long. <laughs> Got to stand up. That's yeah, right. she's a total master teacher. She's trick. a master teacher. Right. At least the <laughs> grateful is not making you do yoga. <laughs> Sometimes it, they'll do that. Uh, as far as I can tell, you're the first poetry editor, or at least, you know, 
who, I mean, we've had other poets who edited things, but uh, the first person who actually does this uh, professionally. And I have to say, the idea of editing a poem just sounds completely mysterious to me. Mm. I mean, I edit all day long, and you know, I take people's reviews of books, and I you know, just make them smoother or clearer, or try to bring out their voice. But it seems to me that any editing you would do to a poem would be real violence to it. So how do you do that? It can be. You have to be careful. Um, it's easy to go too far. I mean, the kinds of suggestions that, you, that would be totally appropriate to make in a piece of prose would not right. be good to, you know, because the choice of the word, the particular choice of the words is so uh, intimately related to the effect of the poem that you can't just say, wow, you can't say candelabra there, why don't you just say candle holder or something. I mean, yes. it's like, because those, but um, there are, um, when somebody writes a book of poem, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm edit, I edit books of poems, so I'm looking at a, a group of, of work. Right. So it's so there's conversations you can have about, well, in this poem you, uh, you you can compare this poem to the other poem and say, see in this one you do such a good job of this this isn't, but here you lose focus in this line or you just or this is a little confusing or it seems you seem to miss. Uh, what you're trying to get at here? Can you can you clear, can you go back and clarify? Can you mm -hmm. make it better or whatever like that? Can so, people do that? Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. So because what happens when you write poems is that you get lost. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't you don't know what you're doing anymore, and they go through so many revisions, and there's so many different things, and 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 so you can forget that in 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 earlier drafts it was totally obvious that you were sitting in a restaurant, but you it's not obvious anymore. You forgot. To just you know it because you're writing the poem, but you Love forgot it. to mention it. So you read the poem, and like, where is this happening? Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, it's in a restaurant. And you're like, well, you don't say that. Like, how nobody's going to know that? Oh, right. That would be. Right. Maybe I should call this in the restaurant. That would help. Yeah. <laughs> Stuff like that. Yeah. You know. So so it's it's th things like that, or or also just sometimes, um, a lot of times poets will go on a bit long in their mm -hmm. poems, or or take a bit of a time to get started, mm -hmm. and so you can say, you know, I mean, it's a very annoying. Anybody who's been in a poetry workshop knows this is the most annoying thing anybody, one of the top 80 things, annoying things people can say. <laughs> but I think the poem really starts here, or, or right. it should end up here. But, but I, I, that is actually true. It's sometimes. certainly common, the stuff I edit. Right. We often see the lead really is several paragraphs down. Right, so it's the same thing with poems. There's a lot of There's, throat clearing. It's, I always say it's like the fun stuff, you know, the, the, remember the fun stones and like the, yes. how, that, where he's like, where he does the thing with his feet, he's in the car and then the car goes. Right. It's like I have a poem yeah. sometimes, like there's a little bit of this and then, yes. you know. So, uh, so yeah, so, and, and you know, you can just say to the person like, hey, it's up to you, I'm not gonna tell you what to do, but like, <laughs> but just put your finger over the first like three lines of this poem and just see that, what right. that looks like. You know, and sometimes, especially they'll trust me because I will have read a lot of their work and I know what I'm talking about. So if I suggest it, like, they might actually, I might just go home and sit with it, you know, see what I see this. And also with books of poems, poets often don't realize that there's a couple that aren't, just aren't as good. Right. So you're like, you know, you should take <clears throat> these out. They're just not as good. Or one is really a revision of another poem. That happens a lot, yeah. too. That, that, that's, that, and the interesting thing about that is, is that Sometimes individually they can be great, but when you put them in the book, you realize they're the kind of the same poem <laughs> right. twice. And they might have been fine when they were separate, right. but together they can't both be there because they're basically the same thing. So it's like you got to make a choice. Right. Selfie's choice. choice. In uh, one of your poems you write, I'm at my desk, pushing against one word, feeling its hinge creak like wind would a gate if it could feel anything at all. Mm. It's a great description of writing or editing, I mm. think. To just pushing on one word, seeing what right. it can take, uh, what it yeah. opens up. Yeah, I mean, that's, I don't know if prose writers do the same thing. Is that, do they do the same thing like Good that? Good ones, yeah. Like, word, like even a, a single word, word like yeah. that? Yeah. 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 You frequently write about sleep in your poems. Yeah. And I've read all your poems in a row. To make you sleepy? No, not at all. <laughs> but it, it, <laughs> but I'm sure you've never wrote, you've never Read them all in a all row. In a row, yeah. have you? No. No. Uh, so it uh, gave me a perspective that is, I think, somewhat unusual. And uh, sleep is a recurring theme in your work. Why is that? Hmm. Uh, well, more recently, it was a recurring theme in my work because I have a young child. So, um, <laughs> but, but I think um, I've always loved the surrealists, and I think that their their whole idea that the dream space and the liminal space between waking and sleeping yes. and the movement from waking into sleeping and that transition there's the, the what starts to happen to your mind like that's intimately connected with the experience 
of both writing and reading poetry. So I think I'm interested in, um, but you know, I mean, I also, I joked about Keats earlier, but Keats is my favorite poet. And you know, for him, sleep and death were so closely aligned to, um, you know, so I think that's probably part of it also. Right, yeah, no, I would, I would say that's true from yeah. my, my experience. But I, the, the honest answer to your question is I don't really know mm -hmm. why. There are several poems that begin waking up. Yeah. Or falling asleep in that transitional liminal moment there, right. uh, where you seem to be saying something about getting away from your conscious mind, getting away from your own anxieties to something freer or more mysterious to yourself. Yeah, or in an associative space, mm -hmm. like a space where you can connect ideas that you know you wouldn't connect if you were busy in your conscious life trying right. to function right. and do things. You know, you have to be logical and keep 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 your act together. But like once that starts to slip a little bit there's a lot of truth that can be found in that type of thinking. And that, that's the thinking of poetry for me. Right. Without opium. Without opium. Yeah. It's totally opium free, yeah, this, these books of poems. Because that's, a, yeah, that's yeah. a dead end, by the way. That is what I've heard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I'm just going to uh. trust you on that one. <laughs> I wanted you to read a poem without intimacy. Uh-huh. Yeah, this is going to prove your thesis. Yes. Poem Without Intimacy. The other day I was shopping in one of those giant, incredibly brightly lit stores you can apparently see from space, wheeling a massive empty cart, thinking, this is a lot like thinking, why do I go to sleep not having brushed my teeth and dream of the giant failure known as high school again? <laughs> On the loudspeaker was a familiar song by Quicksilver Messenger Service. There were no lyrics, but I remember it says, we are all skyscrapers under one blue rectangle that never chose us to be these sentinels who imperceptibly sway and watch people far below like tiny devices no one controls enter our various sunlit glass conversations. The world is old and full as it always will be of commerce and its hopeful nonprofit mitigations. Future products from the Amazon will cure ailments we have and also ones not yet invented. Looking down, I saw my cart was full of a few boxes of some cereal I do not recognize, four flashlights and a pink plastic water bottle made of some kind of vegetable that will eventually, like me, into the earth, harmlessly decompose. And then I passed an entire row of plastic flowers and wanted to be the sort of person who bought them all. But really, I am a runway covered in grass, and all I truly love is sleep. Yeah. I wrote that poem for Juan Felipe Herrera. The former poet laureate. Mm -hmm. The most striking strategy in your poems that I observed is this sudden shift from very ordinary details mm -hmm. to something very profound without any warning at all. Mm -hmm. uh, you see it in this poem all the time, moving from the you know the things in this in the shopping cart to some much larger idea. Uh, how conscious is that? Uh, I think. Not very, but I just think that I'm, I like, I think that's how people think in general. Mm -hmm. I think if you were to just somehow be able to see into someone's mind, I think you would see them rapidly moving between, um, you know, mundane thoughts or observations or visual impressions and big thoughts. Right. You know, or just, or, or, or scary thoughts or, or, or some kind of, you know, emotional impressions or something. I think that's kind of how people, and for me the poem like replicates and attempts to like implicate the reader in, in, that, in that process so that we can experience it in a more conscious way. Mm -hmm. Like I, and yeah, I, I compare it in, in the Why Poetry book to lucid dreaming, mm -hmm. which I've never actually been able to achieve. Apparently some, there's some people who can wake up in their dream. There's probably people in this room who can do it. Can you do it? No, but I've read about it too. Yeah, you can yeah. wake up in your dream and move around and fly and everything yeah. on yeah. purpose and something. Nothing. But like poems are kind of like that. They're, 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 you know, 
I mean, I think they, or they can be. Right. You, know, you have a poem called uh, White Castle where you describe thinking major feelings, such as longing for purpose while eating little square hamburgers with dots in them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Watching dragonflies <laughs> mate. Uh, yeah, it's often charming and funny the way you move between those two things. Uh, read a poem called uh, Erstwhile Harpinger Auspices. Mm -hmm. That's the first poem in that book. Yeah. That's a tough title, too. Um, yeah, well, do you want to hear a story about this poem? Yes, do you guys like hearing the stories, or is it recommended? Yeah. Okay. Well, if you insist. Um, so uh, this poem, um, I had gone to a party with a bunch of writers. I just moved to San Francisco, and um, I didn't know them, but it was like the first like, fancy writer party I'd been invited to, so I, was, I felt it was high stakes. And, um, and I, uh, somebody used the word erstwhile, <laughs> And, and, or I, I think I used the word erstwhile and someone corrected me, my, my usage of it. Oof. I know. And I was, took this, I took umbrage and defended my usage of it, but because everybody has phones now, they could look up what it meant and it turned out I was not correct. In my usage <laughs> of the word which, awesome. which, which I thought, well, whatever. It means it was a long time ago that it happened. But I did not, I did not use it that way. I you, thought it, made, it was continuing to happen. It just, I was wrong, basically. Okay. Must, must we go into it again? Okay. But, uh, but anyway, but, and so then I started thinking about other words whose name that I, that I use that I don't actually know what they mean or are <laughs> incorrect. And then I th just kind of constructed the title of the poem out of three of those words. So the title is called Erstwhile Harbinger Auspices. <laughs> Erstwhile means long time gone. A harbinger is sent before to help and also a sign of things to come like this blue stapler I bought at Staples. Did you know? <laughs> it's, hard, it's hard when someone's laughing next to you. It's great, actually. <laughs> it's like, I feel like, like this blue stapler I bought at Staples. Did you know in ancient Rome, priests called augurs studied the future by carefully watching whether birds were flying together or alone, making what honking or beeping noises in what directions? It was called the auspices. The air was thus a huge announcement. Today, it's completely transparent, a vase. Inside it, flowers flower, thus a little death scent. I have no master, but always wonder, what is making my master sad? Maybe I do not know him. This morning, I made extra coffee for the beloved and covered the cup with a saucer. Skeleton, I thought, and stay very still. Whatever it was will soon pass by and be gone. No. The juxtaposition of the ordinary and the profound is funny in that poem mm -hmm. uh, and creates a kind of tension and mystery that tr keeps drawing us through. So many of your poems, uh, the words are quite clear and we all know the words, but the, f the sense of them uh, escapes us. Mm. I mean, a poem like that, for instance, by the end you've taken us somewhere very, very different. It's become very intimate suddenly. Uh, mm. Take us through that poem. Yeah, well, the, as I mentioned before, the structure of it is just, is just kind of examining those, those words. I mean, it's almost crude, the structure of it, because I just sort of define the words, mm -hmm. you know, I just say what they mean, like in the dictionary, and then and then I I say it, and then I think, oh, what does that suggest to me, or can I, the 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 blue stapler I bought at Staples, I just wrote that and thought that was funny. I mean, I was you know kind of, and the idea that that would be a harbinger, you know, like that that's because it kind of is. You're at Staples, and you're like. Uh, you will buy a stapler. You know, it's like <laughs> it seems ordained because of the name of the store. Uh, but but anyway, but you know, and then and then I just was sort of, yeah, kind of going through what these words mean, but then but then looking for things that that suggests, you know, doorways or, or or pathways or whatever, like you're saying. So that's really just how I write. I'm just looking. I'm looking for that other place I can go. I mean, when I taught composition, I remember saying to my students. You know, the thing is, is when your papers, they're just a hallway, and you just, you're just charging down the hallway as fast as you can go. Yes. But you're moving, you're, you're, you're rushing past all these doors. And why don't you stop and like open the door and go in and see what's in the room, and then go down a little bit and see what's in the room. Stop, think, 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 think. You know, don't just, don't just go charging through. And I think that for me, the poem's exciting because I, I, out of the corner of my eye, see a door, and I'm gonna stop and open it and go in. And a lot of time I go in and there's something in there. And then I go back out, and those lines go away. You know, it's not like that. I mean, most of the time that's true. But in the poem, it's got this, the, the times when there's something interesting in that room, 
you know, then, then that's, so, so it has this, I think it has this quality of moving, but then stopping and digressing, but, but not losing the forward momentum totally, you know. Right. Um, and always the ends surprise me. I mean, the ends always surprise me. I don't know where they're going. I have no idea where they're going. Mm-hmm. And then that, um, yeah. And I don't know, I just, the word skeleton just appeared in that poem. And then I thought, oh, that's this, that's a strange thing to have happen. And it's a little scary. And then maybe if I just wait a little while, I won't feel scared anymore. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. I mean, that's all. I didn't, I don't know if that's a, that might be, be a very small thought or a big one, but yes. or somewhere in between. You know. Could you read uh, the poem Prelude? Yes. That's a pretty weighty title to give a poem. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm an English professor, as Rob mentioned, and, um, you know, but I don't have a traditional training in, Engl- in, in it, um, which just means I've barely read anything. And, uh, and um, so I decided at some point that I should read Wordsworth, because I'm an English professor. It seemed <laughs> like... Yeah, probably you should. Yes. Yeah. And so I started reading the prelude, which is really good, by the way. And, um, and, uh, but it's hard. It's really hard to read it. So it took, I don't know, has anybody read the prelude in here? It's, it's hard, you know. It's really, the language is very complicated. You've got to, like, really grind through, or at least I did. And so uh, over a few days of trying to read the beginning of the prelude, the, his language really started to, like, seep into my own brain. Yes. And then I just decided to write this. I thought, oh, I should just write a poem with the same title, which kind of takes on his diction a little bit. But it was almost involuntary, because after reading it for a few days, I was just, I couldn't stop thinking in these words worthy in, like, sentences, which are sound absurd if you don't pull them off exactly. So, so um, and the first line of this poem is an imitation of the first line of the prelude. The first line of Wordsworth's prelude is, oh, there is blessing in this gentle breeze. That's how, that's how his poem begins. So this is the prelude. Oh, this Diet Coke is really good. <laughs> <laughs> Though, come to think of it, it tastes like nothing plus the idea of chocolate. Or an acquaintance of chocolate speaking fondly of certain times it and chocolate had spoken of nothing. Or nothing remembering a field in which it once ate the most wondrous sandwich of ham and rustic chambered cheese, yet still wished for a piece of chocolate before the lone walk back through the corn, then the darkening forest, to the disappointing village and its super creepy bed and breakfast. (laughs) With secret despair, I returned to the city. Something seemed to be waiting for me. Maybe the chosen guide Wordsworth wrote. He would, even were it nothing better than a wandering cloud, have followed, which of course to me and everyone sounds amazing. All I follow is my own desire, sometimes to feel, sometimes to be at least a little more than intermittently at ease with being loved. I'm never at ease, not with hours I can read or walk and look at the brightly colored houses filled with lives, not with night when I lie on my back and listen, not with the hallway, definitely not with baseball, definitely not with time. Poor Coleridge, son of a vicar and a lake, he could not feel the energy, no present joy, no cheerful confidence, just love of friends and the wind taking his arrow away. Come to the edge, the edge beckons softly. Take this cup full of darkness and stay as long as you want and maybe a little longer. It's such a clever and provocative response to Wordsworth and to that romantic tradition. It starts off pretty caustic and sarcastic and funny, and then it (laughs) ends in a much more tender, much more accepting, in a much more personal way. Uh, but there is, a lot of your poems are about nature in that romantic tradition. You write about nature all the time mm-hmm. uh, in a way that is clearly, uh, you know, you could draw a line from Wordsworth to some of your poems. Uh, you've got a poem called uh, Tiburon. Did you read that? Mm. This is from my first book. Tiburon, uh, which is the name of a town and across the Golden Gate Bridge from San Francisco. How sweet to lie just once like a painter, propped at the top of that hill on my elbow, considering the conundrum of breath. Grasses blow among my limbs, as if wisdom had been withdrawn for safekeeping into the library of fragments. 
I have no purpose except to return back down towards a eucalyptus I love. Its petals are filled with the terrible weight of careless reversal, grief without consequence. It burns with such ease. Just to stand there below it, dreaming of union, all trembling and scent and colors of the moment, is like living inside a flower while making a study of winter. Blue span that leads to a gleaming city, you cannot be crossed by longing. And another one from that collection oh. called American Linden. This is the title poem mm. of, the, of the collection. American Linden, which is a kind of tree you probably know. American Linden, when you'd like to remember the notion of days, turn to the barn asleep on its hill a red shoulder holding the weight of clouds. You could stand still for so many moments. So little is over and over required, letting the wind brush your crown. The lathes of tobacco swing into autumn. Swallows already discuss the winter. I know you are tired of imagination, all that clumsily grasping the sunlight. Aren't you tired of bodies too? Whenever it rains, they fall from the sky and darken your window. Clutching each other, they call out names while you sit in the circle thrown by a lamp and pretend they are leaves. The potatoes cringe and bury their heads. Do you see them? They know where to return when hoofbeats come. Like you, they were not born with pride. They were born with skins made of earth. Their eyes are black, and they sing out of tune, quietly under the snow. What do you think of that poem now, <sighs> years after writing it? Um, what, I, that's great. That's exactly what I was thinking when I was reading it. Like, I mean, I was a you know, different person yeah. when I wrote that poem. Um, this is not a poem you would write now. No, but I like it. It's, it's, it's because it's, I, think it's bra I think it's like it has a bravery of a, of a young Mm -hmm. Poet, you know, where I just say stuff and I say these big pronouncements and then I move on to the next thing and it feels very sincere. Yes. Actually, like super sincere, which I really like. And I think it's, I think it's, um, I'm not a person who goes around liking my old poems, you know, whatever. But, no, like, but I was like, but I mean, I kind of, I'm surprised that I liked reading that in front of other people now. It's, but, it, but um, yeah, I don't know. I think it, it's another thing about it is, is that when I, it does remind me of Eastern and Central European poets who were very influential and important to me. And the sort of animation, you know, the way that I animate these... Um, potatoes? Potatoes and, and leaves and trees, you know, whatever that sort of pantheistic, like right. animating of the landscape is, 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 I think, something that came to me from, from this, you know, this European tradition. It's more of an, an American one. There's no uh, sarcasm in that poem. No. Really. No. no. Yeah. Again and again, we see trees in your poems. We see bees. We see lots of birds. Uh, what is nature, how does nature function in your work, do you think? Or how did it? Well, I mean, that, that poem I wrote when I was, in, I was in graduate school in Amherst, Massachusetts. I also was an undergrad in Amherst, too. So that, It's a beautiful setting. Of yeah, and it's all, it's, it's, America's very young. For, for our, our civilization of America is obviously very young compared to other places. Right. I mean, America itself is not young, I mean, the, the landscape. But that, that feels like an old part of America to yes. me compared to some other places. And so I felt the history in that place a lot of the landscape. Mm -hmm. And so I think that for me... Um, I also am scared of nature. Like I'm not a big, I'm not, I don't, I, I get scared when I go out into the, you know, I'm like, I don't understand what's going on a lot of the time. And mm -hmm. I feel like I didn't grow up, you know, camping or going for hikes and stuff like that. So for me, it's a very like weird experience to do that stuff. So, um, so I'm, I'm very aware of like all the, of the, of the way that the landscape feels alive to me. Interesting. You, know? you once told an interviewer, a lot of poets are terrible readers. <laughs> Yeah. Often they go That's on true. too long, and they choose the wrong poems to read. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you're a great reader of your own poetry. I have to say, uh, could you quickly close with a poem that I just love? Uh, I mean, I can't, I'm not fitting it in thematically here. I just mm. think it's a great poem to end on. Called Letter to a Lover. 
Is yeah, this? where is that's that? in here. Yeah. There it is. Yeah, this is a love poem that I wrote to my wife early in our relationship. So, um, and there's actually a, um, I have a friend whose name is Gabe Kahane. He's a young, he's a composer, brilliant composer, and he did some musical settings in my poems. And actually, this they did a, he and this band, this uh, chamber orchestra called Brooklyn Rider did this amazing recording of this and, and the best recording of it is on YouTube and they're in a hotel room just doing it and they're playing and he sings it and plays it. Oh, wow. So if you like the poem, you can go see it after. So. Letter to a lover. Today I'm going to pick you up at the beige airport. My heart feels like a field of calves in the sun. My heart is wired directly to the power source of mediocre songs. I'm trying to catch a ray of sunlight in my mouth. I look forward to showing you my new furniture. I look forward to the telephone ringing. It is not you. You are in the kitchen trying to figure out the coffee maker. You are pouring out the contents of your backpack. I wonder if you now have golden fur. I wonder if your arsenal of kind remarks is empty. I remember when I met you, you were wearing a gray dress that was also blue, not unlike the water plus the sky. They say it's difficult to put a leash on a hummingbird. So let us be no longer the actuary of each other. Let us bow no longer our heads to the tyranny of numbers. Hurry off the plane with your rhinestone covered bag full of magazines that check up on the downfall of the stars. I will be waiting for you at the bottom of the moving stairs. It's just so lovely. <laughs> Thanks. And then I ended up married. <laughs> That's what I would marry. Be you. careful. <laughs> I do. It's been such a pleasure talking to you. Thanks, Thank you Ron. so much Thank for coming. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank all of you. <clears throat> this has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.